This interview may crush me, but I'm here. You are listening to the award-winning Chris Wargo. You lived in Hawaii for a time, so did you ever film there? No, you're talking about my long ago youth. I worked for a year at a power company, then I got married, and Kathy and I, my first duty station turned out to be Hawaii on Oahu. Although most of the time I was on what we call temporary duty in uh, Korea, Thailand, and Japan. Uh, so I would disappear for a couple months at a time, and Kathy was on her own. Uh, but no, at that point, I had never, ever thought of uh, making a, let's call it a career. Even now, it's my second career out of acting. Uh, I had done sports on the FM radio station uh, at the university, and I was her- I was terrible. I mean, I was just terrible. But that was the days when you had to get go your own copy and edit it. And of course, no one listened because it was the classical radio station at the university. So, but I did live for five years in Hawaii. And uh, then I left there for California, went to Boston for 10 years. And now I'm down here in Annapolis, Maryland. That's a shot of my dock behind me. Uh, Obviously, I'm not really sitting there right now. But I've seen it in person. It's lovely. I love it. And you mentioned a lot of different states. I do want to mention Montana since you visit there a lot. How good are you at skiing and driving a snowmobile? What stories have you heard about me? Well, I lived in Michigan also when I was working at the power company. I lived in Georgia for a time being at, and Indiana in the Army. But uh, Montana, for about oh, a good almost 20 years, every year I would go to a very large conference in Montana. Uh, it's an IEEE aerospace conference. And I didn't start doing that again until, I don't want to admit it, in my 50s. So I started to ski again, and I thought I was getting pretty good. I got a few stories snowmobiling, but my best stories are horseback riding. Because in Montana, it's not like you take a drug horse and you're on it just a very plain trail. <laughs> I got there with another guy who was, uh, oh God, he was tall. His legs dragged on the ground around his horse. Um, and the, <laughs> the guy goes, okay, this is how you move a horse left, right, forward, and backward. And you ready? And we said, yep. And we just went straight up hills. This is three feet of snow, wintertime, and down. I, that horse was doing things I didn't know a horse could do. And uh, on one spot, we're going across the little flat, and the guy disappears. Uh, there was a hole full of snow. Um, and we're going across another shale-sided hill. My horse loses it. It just slips out from under me. I roll off the other side. And uh, I don't know how many horse stories you want, because my best one was uh, one time uh, with, a, with a group, and I was at the end. I always got the biggest horse, a plow horse. And we go across a little stream, and we had to go up about a 10 or 12-foot muddy embankment. And uh, my horse gets about halfway up and he loses it. And uh, I go tumbling off the back and I'm laying flat spread eagle in that uh, stream, stuck in the mud. And this horse, this horse had huge hoofs, you know, 10 inches across. And they're slamming around my head. And I'm trying to hold the horse up with my hands like I could do that. Anyhow, I recovered. The guide comes over. She's got this brim looking down at me with the sun coming up. I thought she was an angel. She says, oh, I suppose you want to go home now. I said, hell no, I paid for this. Now you got to listen to the punchline was, uh, I get home and of course I have to call my wife and say, ah, do I say I went horseback riding or not? Because every time I would go, she would say, you don't want to do that. That's dangerous. And so I told her the story and she says, Chris, I'm so happy you didn't die. Because the headlines here in Annapolis would read, horse's ass killed by horse's ass. I did want to get to the time that you spent at the Tom Tartaroff New York Acting Conservatory. What kinds of things did you learn there? It was about 2015. uh, My wife had started to do background on House of Cards. And I thought, great, that's her thing. You know, she's having a great time doing it. I'll stay away from it, you know. But she dragged me in uh, to one of the large scenes, you know, where there were six or 800 extras. uh, And I got the bug. So I started to do some of those. And then I said, well, I can take on speaking parts. And so I started to search for those. Um, and of course, they started to be in uh, what we call uh, crime recreation. In, in the district here of, uh, in D.C., we had a couple of companies that were doing uh, crime recreation shows for the ID Channel, Real Z, TV One. 
And uh, a woman named Thea Washington, who's a casting person now, was casting then. And she gave me my real first speaking job on copycat killers. For a year or two, I took some lessons, uh, doing time, got some independent movies. Esther, you, uh, introduced me to uh, a director in Fredericksburg, and he put me into a couple of his independent films. Uh, and I think we even had a scene together in one of them. But I had taken some courses uh, on a weekend from a gentleman named Tom Totterloff. And Tom is, uh, he's an interesting guy. He is very pointed in his acting direction. He doesn't mess around. He, he kind of like tells you the truth. Uh, but I was thinking if I'm going to do this, I should really get some training. So turns out Tom was operating a two year acting conservatory. If you finish it, you get credits at one of the universities, Long Island University. Well, I didn't need the credit. I already have enough degrees, but, uh, but since Tom knew me, I didn't have to re audition. And I, yes, I moved up to New York. Kathy, my wife and I rented, uh, an apartment. And um, I started to go to class, uh, you know, all day for uh, essentially it was four semesters, two years. We had some great instructors. Um, it was a lot of work. Also, uh, I wish I could have had more time on most things because there was so much to do. And, you know, the demands were the next day. So it was a lot of triage. So I look back and it was good training. It was, I guess people would call it classical training, everything from Shakespeare. Hey, I got 10 out of 10 points on ballet. Um, but it was really geared towards stage, um, not so much film. Unfortunately, COVID hit in the middle and uh, we went to Zoom. So it turned out to be all about film. Although there were people in the class from Portugal, Toronto, Spain, uh, South America, Mexico, and across the U.S., coast to coast. So, of course, you can imagine uh, in the course, we're trying to make movies as though we're all in one place. So we had a lot of fun doing that. And I think we did pretty good, given it was Zoom. Um, it wasn't fun sitting on Zoom six or eight hours a day, but I did finish the course. And uh, then I was already here back in Annapolis. So I'm just constantly, you know, auditioning. I got another one to do today. Um, I picked up some better agents. Uh, not a lot of traction with him yet, but I'm hoping to build. Um, and so I'm still really doing a lot of independent um, movies, longs and shorts. I've uh, been the lead in some, but generally supporting or co-star on a TV. Um, still work with that person in Fredericksburg. And I got some filming this weekend to do and some, uh, what's they call ADR, voice replacement for another 2B episodes that I filmed or first part of July. And I'm still taking an acting class basically once a week from a woman that teaches here out of Gaithysburg. I should give her some credit, uh, Katie Kalaki. Uh, a number of our background friends and other people that started that way have taken her. You recently won Best Actor in a DMB series called Gene. So what did that experience mean to you? Well, you know, it's always nice to be told uh, or have people say that was good. As you know, because you've done it, whether it's stage or film or film, nobody gives you a response, you know, because it's not the cameraman's job to judge your performance. So don't even bother asking him. On stage, uh, people will come up afterwards because you'll probably be hanging around and uh, they will say, oh, that was really good. Uh, and you have to remember as an actor <laughs> not to reply with, oh, you should have seen me Thursday because for them, that's all they saw. So it takes a while to learn that, just to say, oh, thank you. That was very nice of you to say so. But with uh, Rico out of, uh, uh, Rico Mickens is his name. He's a writer, director, filmer, editor. He takes his movies and he puts them into some of the local festivals. He's got a lot of categories. One of them was a couple of years ago, I got Best Supporting Actor in a short. And this time uh, I did get an award for playing a Russian character. I loved that Russian character because I could use my Russian accent. So it was a riot. Played that Russian uh, spy character basically on an episode three and did receive the uh, best, best actor award for a, a DMV short. 
So that was fun. And it was a good time to uh, have everybody at least acknowledge that you're, you know, you're not always terrible. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you also gained some recognition for technologies that help out our overall aviation infrastructure. So are you an engineer by trade? Uh, my dad had been an electrician. Uh, my career, I thought, was in engineering, and, and so it was for the first 30 years. Uh, that twisted from power engineering, as I mentioned, worked at a power company in Detroit. Uh, once I got in the service, I was doing more uh, communication design, both all types of communication, radio, satellite, uh, landline, uh, microwave, and uh, that was valuable to industry. So once I left the service, I worked in uh, defense intel, basically, building systems for tactical and strategic purposes. And that was with some big companies. Uh, I was on the rise, uh, basically a manager in software technology and other technologies, and uh, and also had a business area at the same time to run. And that kind of got, by mergers, it got twisted. And I wound up down here in Annapolis, Maryland, in the aviation sector, on a company owned by the airlines. And we did worldwide communications, both air to ground and uh, ground ground networks uh, for countries that didn't have networks uh, largely at times a lot of traffic in the U.S. and support projects to the FAA. And that was good until about, again, about 10 years and uh, corporate changes were made. And uh, I think I had about 400 people working for me at the time. So I was, uh, again, feeling like I was growing in the industry. Uh, but things happened and I wound up in small business um, and still technically I'm employed by a small business today. Matter of fact, but we just had a whole company-wide meeting today. I don't put a lot of time in at this point anymore because I'm really full-time uh, chasing acting gigs or uh, role-playing. Um, along the way, I've mentioned, uh, you probably have done it, others have. It's called standardized patient. It is a way to act, but it's for medical students. Uh, I do a similar thing uh, at Quantico for one of the training agencies down uh, down there. and. Uh, and I've also done uh, witness work for training lawyers, criminal defense, which I just finished another week about a week ago. It's a lot of fun because you have 24 characters to play across four court cases. And you don't know which one you're going to be asked to do until you walk in the room. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> and of course, they'll ask the most wild stuff. So, yes, I came out as an engineer and never, 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 never thought I would be acting or in front of a camera. Um, I'm happy that I my wife dragged me into it. You know, it, it it's it's a cross between fun and it's a cross between it's a lot of work. And of course, everybody says to themselves, yeah, we can do this. Um, of course, when you're standing on that stage or you're looking down the barrel of the camera, um, you know, we all have issues and ticks and I have my set. Uh, but uh, up until now, I'm getting by. Fantastic. This interview may crush me, but I'm here. Oh, you and I both, buddy. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Well, I did want to talk to you about a documentary called Running with a Covert Narcissist. Is there anything that you learned about narcissism that you may not have realized or thought about before filming that project? I played a father, of course. That's my roles are father, grandfather, lawyer, statesman, or you know, congressman, judge. Generally, my best role is old guy that dies. Oh, dear. You know, this country is dealing with a big narcissist right now, not to peg anybody. Uh, so I guess we're all learning about how to deal with that some way or from another. But um, his mission was to try to make people aware of it. And uh, I don't know if he was up to giving them tools necessarily of how to participate with those kind of individuals. But I think that was his mission. And uh, every so often I'll hear from him. He's, uh, you know, having another screen of his film. And uh, and I got an interesting people to work with on that one also. Nice. Well, you were also in a Christmas movie that aired on BET Plus and on Prime. So had you heard about that from an agent or was that a casting call you found on your own? It was uh, Octet Productions. And uh, I really was scheduled just to be background. 
And there was some mix up in something else. And when I got there, they said, no, you're Santa Claus. This is how these things usually happen anyhow. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, I'll be Santa Claus. They had an outfit. And a woman comes up. She says, oh, I got to mic you. Really? Okay. Well, do I have lines? She says, oh, yeah, yeah. You have to say something. I said, oh, they didn't tell me. Okay. Well, put the microphone on. And so then I got a little ambitious and I went out and found out from somebody, well, what am I supposed to be saying if I got to speak it? Well, you know, I had, I had a whole uh, <clears throat> two words, Merry Christmas. So as the lead actor comes around the corner, I'm this kind of decrepit looking Santa Claus with my little pot and I get to say Merry Christmas, for which they had to pay me as a day player. And I got residuals. Yay. It was kind of crazy because I'm doing my taxes and I had this extra W-2 for $3. And I can't figure out what it's for. And so I just claimed it. Two months later, I get the residual check through SAG for $3. Of course, they take out the taxes and the Social Security and, <laughs> and the state tax. And Maggie Francis, that's her name. Uh, every so often, she'll remember me and I'll get a call. Um, and it may be background, but, you know, work is work. Yes, work is work. So speaking about work, let's talk about the opposite. What are some of your hobbies nowadays? I still have uh, tons of housework to do and yard work. So I find myself, I'm gainfully, I mean, I'm fully employed. I'm, trust me, I'm not just sitting in my ass all the time watching TV, although I probably do that too much at night. Um, but this has become, I don't want to call it a hobby. This has become what I do right now. Yes, I mean, we can call it a career. You've taken it serious enough to call it that. I just couldn't see myself golfing every day. And if I'm going to be around the house, my darling wife will have plenty of things for me to fix uh, or <laughs> ideas to build. What it really does, I'm in it for the participation. Uh, you know, well, of course, on stage, you get an ensemble effect. And film, you get a short-term effect with other actors and the people that are on the set. You take a course. If you do other things, you know, you're out with people. I'm not just watching TV, eating potato chips. Um, so I think that's that's a strong reason that I keep doing it. Other than, as I said, it's a cross between fun and sometimes agony when you can't figure out, well, why didn't they take me for that part? You know, I thought it was perfect. So what keeps you motivated when, you know, times are slow and you want to stay active in our industry, but it's just either there's a strike or there's a pandemic? Yes, there is the strike going on right now. We went through COVID. That put a crunch on things. I am still figuring out how to get back to New York and see if I can be up there longer. Um, my agent just sent me today um, a day player role that's out of New York, which I have to do the audition for. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, I'm willing to go as most actors are uh, right now. I'll go anywhere if the if the fee is there, uh, but I kind of go Pittsburgh to New York to Richmond and the Mid-Atlantic, that's my area. It just seems that some people get discouraged when there aren't projects in town or it doesn't seem like there's anything to do. I could go off on the track as many do. Okay, if you want work, fund it, film it yourself and be in it. I haven't quite stepped up to that. I don't really wanna do project management or director kind of things right now. I've done that my whole life in management. Uh, I really just wanna participate as the actor right now and. Uh, know that I got my feet solid on the ground there. Uh, I know I came out of the conservatory better than I went in because I remember sitting on a set of a short movie we did called uh, Regaining Innocence. And uh, literally the lights were crashing behind me, falling down. And, you know, to, you know but I noticed that I sat there, you know, I was in my space and just waiting for that word action. Um, I wasn't tied up in all that other stuff. And then when the SAG strike is over, maybe the gates will open up again and there'll be some day player roles. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to go after some good day player roles. If shows come to town in the D.C. area, Pat Moran often winds up with the day player auditions. I've done a couple of those. If it's in Richmond, Eric Arvold often winds up with those. As you know, if something opens up on Actors Access or even backstage and it's have substance, I mean, those people could be getting 4,000 or more responses to, you know, and somehow they go through them and they'll pick the 30 or 40 or maybe even less people that say, give us audition tapes. 
So it's it's kind of a win. One of my first courses I took is a guy named Aaron Marcus. He's local Baltimore. He already says, if you got to do the audition tape, you had a win. Because you do that, everything else is out of your hands. The only thing you could really control is that performance or how you set it up to do the audition tape. Everything else could be, well, you're too short. Your hair's not the right color. He also says, do everyone as though you're never going to get the job. Because if you're worried about trying to figure out what they want, you're probably wrong. The first thing you do as an actor is you read a book called The Four Agreements. And one of those agreements is never take anything personally. And it's very hard to get accurate feedback. Tom never, never pulled a punch. He called it as he saw it. Or I've had other acting coaches in the conservatory too, because we had several of them. Matter of fact, uh, I think I mentioned to you somewhere before, three of them were up for Tony's this year, and one of them actually got it, Marion Silverman. There are hundreds of styles of acting, and every coach is a little different. They have their thing. Whatever works for you, I think you you take it, uh, as well as to listen to the Anthony Hopkins and the Michael Caines and Tom Hanks. Yes, so valuable to go through all those interviews and see how they got to the top the way they did. All right, Chris. I really thank you for taking your time for what you're doing in this interview and others, obviously, to give us all a chance to have a voice. Hopefully, I'll be able to come to another house party of yours. That's an amazing place you and Kathy have. Thanks to all the listeners from the UK, India, Canada, and Germany. I see you in my analytics. Thanks for tuning in from so far away.